Welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Andrea Miller. I am the host of Open Relationships Transforming Together. I'm joined by Joanna Schroeder and our amazing producer, Brian Atkins. Ooh, we have a show teed up that is going to be intense for me, talking about some, some challenges in my own marriage, some real reflections on my parents, whom I adore, but there's some new things that have come to the surface in my life that make me go, ooh, Dr. Joe, I need your help. And Dr. Joe is Dr. Joe Court. He's an amazing psychotherapist that talks about narcissism and what's the other one, uh, Joanna? Uh, mixed mixed marriage? Mixed orientation marriages where one mixed, person is okay. heterosexual and the other person is not. Oh. And so much more. Joe is a master. And so I'm excited and nervous to get into it with him. So let's uh, let's bring Joe Court on. Yeah, Yay. let's bring him in. I am delighted to welcome the one and only Joe Court. Joe is a PhD a psychotherapist, licensed master social worker, a board certified clinical sexologist, author of seven books, lecturer, and TikTok star. Dr. Court specializes in marital problems, mixed orientation marriages, male sexuality and sexual health concerns, sexual identity issues, childhood sexual abuse, and so much more. Dr. Court, thank you very, very much for joining us. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I got to tell you that the timing for you to speak with us is uncanny. Things are blowing up in my life relationships wise. This is an unusual way for us to start the show. But narcissism, something you specialize in and talk about a lot, has reared its ugly head. So can you help me? I hope so. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for real. I mean, you know, I realize this is a really big topic on TikTok and, you know, we can make fun of it and so forth. But the, the truth is, especially in watching some of your TikToks and reading a bunch of your work, it was like, oh, my God, that's. That's me. That's that's my life. Well, first of all, I like that you're saying. So a lot of people complain there's so too much talk about narcissism online and on the internet. But the problem that people don't understand, I've been a therapist almost forty years. We never talked about it years and years ago. And then people didn't understand there's covert versus overt. And so to me, I don't think we can ever talk about it enough. But I like what you said. There's a continuum. Not everybody's a narcissist, but people can look narcissistic if they have unresolved trauma. If they were a product of neglect or abuse in their childhood, they could be narcissistically defended. I mean, there's all kinds of um, on the continuum, just like you said. So you want to know what you're dealing with because that that'll change how you respond to them. Well, and that was what I was going to ask is it's like a lot of times and we joke about it on this show is like it's hard to when we're talking about real people, even if we don't know them, it's hard to find a bad guy because it's like we can see this big picture of, you know, this person does these things. And this is very true in my marriage where. My husband and I are very open and he had a lot of trauma as a child. I look at him and I'm like, you're doing this terrible thing, but it comes from hurt. And it's not a, a it's not a crime or anything. It's just, you know, things we do in relationships that hurt each other that we all do. And you could say, is this a narcissist? Is this narcissistic behavior? Narcissish? How do we separate out like this comes from their wound with letting them get away with all of their garbage? I mean, I feel like with a narcissist you or any a narcissist person, you have to really keep your boundaries. You have to maybe even be open to restating what your needs are. No, my need has not gotten met. No, I uh, I hear what that you feel like you did, and I I recognize you in that, and I'm still not satisfied with whatever. So you may have just almost be a broken record, and you may or may not still get your needs met. Totally. And just, you know, keeping those boundaries is a like, OK, right. I mean, that it's it's a really important reminder. There was a um, like family lawyer that I was speaking with maybe two or three years ago, and she stated something similar to what you did. She'd been in practice like as long as you, 30, 40 years, and said in the last 10 years, the incidents of narcissism that have been cited as grounds for divorce these last 10 years has been explosive. And so I'm wondering, is it that it is more common that this is happening? Or is it just that people are identifying these traits? Or is it just, you know, 
I, what is that? I mean, is it is it a greater prevalence of of narcissistic actual narcissistic personality disorder or narcissistic kind of uh, um, traits? I mean, I, I think that we're seeing it more in the, uh, our society and even online media, uh, social media. People are aware of it more. So I think I, I don't know for sure. I don't think that the prevalence is going any higher, but I do think that understanding of it is higher. And I do like the uh, what you're saying is that there because you're seeing there there is a more of a narcissistic um, way of being in the world because we're on social media. It's all about me. Uh, there's a lot of defensiveness from people. The trolling, uh, you know, I'm right, you're wrong. So it, it, that doesn't mean it's narcissistic. It's not narcissistic. It's not a, dis- a personality disorder, but it's a narcissistic trait. It depends. Right, right. Because, in fact, there's something that you wrote that was a couple things. First one I want to read. You say regarding narcissists, the very thing that they're critical of in others are disowned aspects of themselves, which they project onto others without realizing they are doing so, when, in fact, their criticisms can be viewed more as unconscious confessions of their own shortcoming. Um. You know, I don't know that it fits into the narcissistic um, category, but I will say there are two kind of responses when you asked me earlier that I would have to what he said to you was one would I'm not interested in your feedback about my um, my behaviors. If I am, I promise you, I will ask you and I will be all ears. I'm not. So if I don't ask you, please don't give me feedback. That's one thing. I love um, that. <laughs> so good and then the other um thing that I always tell people that has worked for me because i was raised in a narcissistic family that's why i know so much about it it was like a, a, a school uh basically for it growing up but to be able to say to somebody well no, they'll, they'll often say i don't get it i don't really understand wait what and my response is you don't have to get it you just have you don't have to get it i don't need you to get it i just need you to do it period well, or just in my case, I just wanted him like I I I was I, for the record, I was not throwing a tantrum. I just wanted to say, like, when you when you spoke to me like that, it just it was painful for me. And, and at that point, you know, and I know you're a big Imago guy, too. We we love Harville and Helen. We love Imago therapy uh, just to say, oh, I could see that, you know, and I, one one thing that I've done, some of the coaching I've done with other people and it's so powerful is. I'll say like, you know, to a mom and a daughter, like they're having this conflict, mom and a teenage daughter. And I'll say, what's, you know, what's the one thing you want from her and she wants from you? And the daughter will say whatever it is. And I'll say, hey, Sally, can you see that even if that's just one percent true, even if it's just one percent true, can you acknowledge that? And she's like, I can see that it's at least one percent true. And that's what I want to say to my husband, like. Can you see that this is maybe even just 1% true, right? And then it's like, well, okay, right? So I didn't try that, but I'm going to try that next time. Because it's like- So like my husband always wants me to do that and I want him to do that. And what I have learned is he wants something from me that I don't feel safe to give him. Either because I don't trust how he's going to react or something from my past. So it's like, why can't you just admit X, Y, Z? And it it's what I- really come down to every time we have a conversation like that is it's not emotionally safe for me to do that for you and then we just had a fight like that last weekend and it was the same thing where I had to go like have I made this an emotionally safe place for him to do that and you can see how two people who really care about each other can drift apart even after all these years when you both don't feel safe yes yes it's true Joe, did Joe, you know is, there any, Joe is there any hope for us? Is there any hope for us? <laughs> yes, because you're, you're self-reflecting and you're open to learning new ways of being with your partners. That's what we all should be doing in relationships. Yeah. Well, I want to ask Joe a question because before we started recording, we talked about the fact that I'm from a very conservative area in West Michigan and grew up with a lot of shame. And when you were doing Joe's bio, you mentioned that he talks about like mixed orientation couples. And I am in a mixed orientation marriage because I am a, I mean, I've always said bisexual woman, but I think the term is actually probably pansexual as in I don't have a specific gender need to be with somebody. It's more about personality. And my husband is um, a straight heterosexual guy. And there have been so many times when he'll say, sometimes I just worry that you won't be happy if you can't be with a woman. 
And I wonder, this sounds like something that you have a degree of specialty. And I wonder what you say to couples when they're in that situation. I mean, I don't, people always look to you, uh, me as a couple therapist, right? And ask me for an answer to that. Or, you know, what is, what is the most. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And really, I don't have the answer to that. The answer is between the two of you. And, and it, I would want to ask him, you know, I'm it's good that he voiced that to you because people do have concerns that people that are bi or pan can't stay committed. Like they can't make a choice and be able to live with that choice all the way through. So it's a normal question for him to ask. And, um, but, but it, it, but pansexual and bisexual people can make a decision. And you did. Yeah. Well, and I always say to him, like, you love ladies. And he does. He loves ladies. And he loves them as friends. He loves them as girl. He's always loved ladies. He's a ladies man. And I'm like, but you don't have to have all the ladies. Right. And he's so like, it's wild because he's the most hardwired monogamous person I've ever met. Like when he likes one person, every other person disappears to the point where I thought it was self-denial because I'm not like that. And I thought he's lying, he's lying or he's in denial. And it has made me realize that maybe what you're saying is the question isn't can bi and pansexual people be monogamous? It's who can and can't be monogamous, almost like an orientation, right? It's different within each of us. It doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is. Like, am I yes. on track there? Yep. And what he's also telling you it's co- that I would think as a therapist is he's has some insecurities about your attachment to him. And he's telling how attached he is to you and how you're going to leave me. That's the main thing to worry about. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. That's exactly what I was thinking. And I just, it's like, oh my God, I feel like we all have more power in our relationships than we realize. We're always waiting for the other person. And I'm, and it's good advice even for me because that time, like what I just described, where it's hurt, you know, it really hurt Sanjay to hear me criticize him. And I remember, ooh, if I was doing a better job of, being affectionate and being appreciative when I'm giving him the negative feedback that I bet he would have a, an easier time of being able to own that rather than denying it or being defensive, you know? Yes. That's well Is said. Is that true? Okay. Thank mm. you. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I'm going to slip you $200 after, after yeah, the no, right, right, right. It's been a great therapy session for me. <laughs> I know, right? So but Joe- More than that. She's in for it. Milk? She's good. <laughs> Okay, I have another like monogamy question for you. Like again, we did the interview with therapy and are doing mine. There's a thing where sometimes I I'm really bothered by prescriptive monogamy in our society, especially for heterosexual couples, where it's like there's only one way. There's just monogamy. Everyone else are and I grew up in an evangelical area, so there was like you're just a sinner, you're just a slut, whatever. The question is like, (laughs) yeah, like it's so frustrating to me. Like, even if I'm like, I'm just so curious about how many people are are non-monogamous by nature or by orientation. It's like society looks at me and is like, she's just a horn dog. And like any straight men that are listening are like, that's my gal. Like they objectify you and fetishize you. And I'm like, I just want to have a conversation about this. And I mean, Ultimately, it comes down to this question. Are we pathologizing a normal thing to want to be with people other than just the person you're married to? Like, maybe that's a normal thing. Maybe we've made it, like, diseased and weird and maybe even overly sexualized. Like, where do you come out on that? Well, I mean, most of the science points to the fact that we're we're not wired for monogamy. That we can choose monogamy, but we're not wired for it. We're, we're wired for variety. We're wired for novelty. But that doesn't have to cancel out. But do you know the word I like? You like the word, I love that word, narcissist. I'm going to borrow it if you don't mind. But I, the word I also like about this is we're a monogonormative culture. We're monogamy. Mm. And anything that's not monogamous is pathologized. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so, like, where do you see... Where do we go as a society? Like, how do we, uh, I feel like we've advanced so many ways talking about queerness and and different things that used to be kind of aberrant. Where do we go now with this so that it doesn't have to be so much shame because we know people cheat like crazy in relationships. Very few people are actually monogamous, right? They just say they are. Where do we go? Well, I feel like, so the gay and lesbian couples are often much better at talking about monogamy versus non-monogamy 
right from the beginning. Gay guys do it right from the the dating app, you know, where they're. But uh, I say to my couples, even if they say they're monogamous, I look at them and say, "Have you negotiated your monogamy?" And they look at me like, "What do you mean that we're we're not we're monogamous?" I'm mm -hmm. like, "Can you masturbate? Can you um have cyber sex with someone? Can you flirt with somebody? Can you um you know have cyber sex with somebody uh, live with a live cam?" And one partner will often say, "No, we're monogamous," and the other partner will say, "Well, because." Monogamy means different things to different people. And in my opinion, the way to deal with it is to have those conversations. Yeah. So we just need to make it normal. Yeah. And maybe like Andrea, we're raising, both of us are raising teenagers. And maybe the idea too for us as parents, I'm always looking for a parenting lesson because I'm writing a book too. Maybe for us as parents too, the lesson is trying to teach our kids that that's a normal conversation to have when they start dating. Yes. Yes. There's options and that what's right for you may not be right for the couple over there. And most couples are not telling the truth. You kind of said that, Joanna, earlier. I, I was at a bar once with some friends and this one was going on and on with about how hot her husband was and she sh passed his picture around. He wasn't with us and he was hot. And she, she was talking about all the great bedroom activity they were having. And um, then after a few drinks, she came up to me privately when she learned I was a sex therapist. She said, he hasn't touched me in three years. Oh, so, oh my poor darling. I, you know, so and, and but she's not alone in doing that. And, and we should be able to talk about this openly. But the thing is, people could shame. Yeah. Well, the let me shame. I want to I want to rewind to you. You know, you said as we we're talking about narcissism, that that's the experience you came from. Um, how have you how have you healed from that? And how old were you? when it was like, oh, that's what happened. Because I feel like the, you know, in my, I mean, my my parents were amazing, but I remember it didn't even occur to me until today. I used to say, oh, it's the Mike and Judy show, right? And it's like this feeling of being, um, never being about me, right? Like never being about me. And, you know, so I, I feel like, like I said at the beginning of our show, like there's so much that's bubbling up for me in my life right now. And it's like no accident that I'm talking to you. <laughs> you're the you're the expert. But what what happened with with you and how have you healed from this? Because I, I don't and I by the way, I think it's maybe there aren't, at, you know, maybe the the clinical diagnosis of um, narcissistic personality disorder. Maybe that's a relatively modest amount. But back to the continuum. Narcissish, n narcissish. I feel like there are a lot of people that would say, "Oh yeah, oh yeah." That that explains a lot. Yeah, I I wasn't until my thirties that I really realized that that was what was going on in my family because we didn't have alcoholism, we didn't have you know physical abuse. There was no nothing overt. My family is overt narcissist. We didn't know the words gaslighting. We didn't have any of that back then. Um, and narcissistic personality disorder was understood but it wasn't um as as uh, understood as like i said as it is now and so what i feel how, how i've healed from it well I actually how i think i survived it if you were to ask my parents today what is what does joe do for a living they wouldn't be able to tell you they they don't and i've a million times um and it's not hard to google my name for a minute and just remember but the parents right so um what i realized i did is i became narcissistically defended in other words nobody little joey so I had to protect myself. And I think that's why you know who I am and why I'm out there so much on TikTok and all the social media. That's where I find my sense of self. The more people see me in media, the more oh. understand or read my stuff, I, I, I exist. Yeah, oh, that oh. hits home for me oh. too, man. That's so did me you, as well. Did you ever, I mean, did you ever have a conversation with your parents where you said, this is how I felt? And were they ever able to own it? Hug. And thousands of times I've had these conversations. And no, I you know, I eventually just gave up and thought they can't see it because it's almost like they just can't like you what you read in the beginning, they can't see themselves. You, they you're the you're the narcissist, not them. Yeah. And I, I the other one that I just want to read because this hits so close to home for me in something you wrote. Um, in therapy, narcissistically defended people sometimes find it difficult to understand their own behavior or feelings of unworthiness. That sounds like me. They are victims of the narcissist's invisible crime. There is an invisible narcissist in the therapy room with them. They think not so much about what their parents did to them, the verbal abuse or neglect, but rather they will say, 
I can't really put my finger on why I feel so abused. I was clothed. I was fed and had a roof over my head. Why then am I complaining? I mean, you just like split me open, Joe. I was yes. like, yeah. oh, shit. Mm -hmm. You know? You're dead, but not mother. You can be parented, but not father. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it just, it feels like that is, you know, it, as, it, as somebody who, I mean, I, I really applaud you and your work as somebody who has put himself out there. And I, by the way, I'm like such a fan. I love it when you dance. <laughs> There's like oh, a really God. cute one of you. Like, it's like such a cute little dancey dance. Um, but no, in all seriousness, I love that, that you're putting yourself out there to say, I am. I mean, that's yeah. freaking awesome. I mean, and, I, and I feel really proud of myself that I did it in a way that um, works for me, right? It's, it's helping people by being out there, educating people. It's helped me make a living out of this, but I am not narcissistic in my real life. In my real life, I, I struggle um, because the way I survive my family is give them what they want, give them what they want, put myself away. And I struggle with being vis being uh, equal to anybody that I'm in relationship mm -hmm. with. Yeah. I want to ask Joe, we were just talking about this in our editorial meeting. Have you seen this spreadsheet that's being spread around where a guy documented every single time his wife rejected him for sex? It's it's so bonkers. And then he, I guess, asked Reddit or something if he was if his wife was the jerk for doing it or if he was for rejecting him or whatever. And he had like all her excuses like I have a stomach ache. I have a headache. I'm tired. And we kept talking about like, what is it about generally straight men today that are in marriages that makes them feel like it's the wife's problem? And maybe I'm getting this wrong. You can correct me. What is happening with straight men that it's like someone saying no to them sexually and it becomes about their wife having a problem instead of like them having a problem that she, they're doing something that causes them to reject them? This is confounding. What do you think? <laughs> you know, I, know you I think what we what we forget is we don't teach little boys to have access to their feelings, to be able to have um, express themselves in, in ways that we allow girls at, and humans to be able to do. We just we tell we teach little boys to turn their back on vulnerability so that they become men. Right. They go from boys to men and they don't know how to express themselves. And so it comes out sideways. So here he, he doesn't. He, it sounds like this man doesn't understand how to say I'm hurt. I feel um, not des undesired. I feel sad. Rather than that, he goes to attack mode and make it about her because he doesn't know any other way. I'm not excusing him. I'm just trying to, I, that's my understanding of why men do that. Like, what should women do in those circumstances? Because to me, like, we're talking about narcissism. A list that's however many items long, producer Brian might have it handy. That, uh, to me, it seems so cruel and it's like I can see in, in generally in society that this has happened to men. I'm writing a book about teenage boys. I totally get it, right? But when that's your husband, it feels like narcissist. It feels abusive. Here's 142 lines of all the times you've rejected me. Like, how do we have compassion for the fact that he might be hurting, but then also have that boundary of like, don't be a prick. Right. Not To not be able to not explain it in a way that is hurtful to her or make it all about her. So- if they came to couples therapy, I would have, here's what I always say. When somebody um, says no in a relationship to something sexual or anything, no is no, but there's still a yes in the room. So how does the yes get their needs met, but the no not become non-consensual and cross their boundaries? That's the erotic tension that couples, I hold in here in my session for couples to have to negotiate around. And maybe hang on, what, what do you, just rewind that a minute because I'm a little bit confused. So you, so no means no. Yes, a million times no means no. But then talk to me about that yes again because I'm a little confused. So um, a, a person may, a partner may say, I don't want to do that or I'm not in the mood or I, I'm, you know, I don't feel good. Um, or so then, but there's still a yes that says, but I still want to do this. And if it becomes an overriding pattern, then maybe you say, okay, how do we, how do we bring the yes in without the no going against themselves? Maybe you just hold me while I masturbate. Maybe, um, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm say yeah. dirty things or look at porn or let or maybe maybe like empowering that person to look at porn or right. something. Is that or what me, you mean? Like, yeah, where's that yes. like a negotiation? And then how does that not become coercion? Like if I guess well, that's then, trust. Well, it can go up, up to the place of, well, maybe I can get my needs met. You know, you don't like that. I might have cyber sex with someone. But if you don't want it tonight, I can maybe have it there. Or maybe we start looking at an open relationship. 
or, or those kinds of things where people don't like to hear all that. But here, there's a great line uh, by Ellen Bader, who's a great marriage therapist and trainer. And she says, when you forbid your partner, you invite secrecy. You say no. Okay, no is no. But there's still a yes there to say, well, and then you can't go get it anywhere else. And I don't care about your needs, but my needs are no. That's, you know, that person's going to have to go maybe try to go get it privately, secretly. And like, that sounds, I can imagine a lot of straight dudes listening to that and being like, see? That's right. I'm going to have to go somewhere else. And then I think of the equivalent maybe of what a woman might feel, which is how about my emotional intimacy? Because I'm not getting that from you, but I can get it from uh, 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 over there that my whoever it was, the janitor at my kid's school. And these are hard conversations, Dan. <laughs> but these are hard conversations, Dan, but they, they need to be had. He needs to, I would teach that straight guy to say um, that I'm thinking about going somewhere else. We need to talk about this. Is that a threat? But I do have needs. And for her to say how much that hurts her and, you know what I mean? Like for them, they have a real conversation around it rather than pretending. It's so that scary. I mean, right? Back to the back to the possibility of rejection and not getting our needs met and just the discomfort. It's like, oh, I can just feel it in my body right now. It's like, um, I got to go to the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> I'm the one that, yeah, I hate prescriptive monogamy. And even thinking about this conversation, even coming from the perspective I'm coming from, I'm like, no, Joe, no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> so uncomfortable. Joe, we need a hologram of you in our homes to hold our yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that we can, we can get through our, our fragile, like, you know, fear-based whatever. But I want to ask you when, you know, when I think about what, so much of what we're talking about now you know, and the show, of course, is called Open Relationships. Um, I've been so humbled in my marriage and in other important relationships by being willing to admit I was wrong. And I try really hard. Right. And um, and I'm just wondering, um, because, it, again, there's also, oh, God, it feels like there's so much defensiveness and heartache and all this stuff in our society. I'm just wondering if, if there was a time or when there was a time, whether it was with your parents or your partner, when you were sure you were right, but it turns out you were wrong. Can you just talk about an experience like that? Because I just, I feel like if more people kind of heard what those experiences look and feel like and having the courage to say I was wrong, because that, that to me is where transformation happens. It is. I agree. I don't know. I, I, I feel like that happens a lot to me though, um, where I, I think I'm right about something. I find out I'm wrong. Um, I don't know. I don't, I am not, I don't have that kind of ego. Even online, I'll get all my comments, all the TikTok comments, that they're shitty because I'm, sometimes I'm wrong and I'm many times I'm wrong. And when I am, I'm like, okay, I'm going to change my, my opinion about this. Or I'm going to get online and do a video about what, when I, I I'm not the right guy to ask this because I don't But when know. you're, well, no, but if you're, if your partner calls you out and is like, hey, Joe, you were wrong about this thing. And are you going to be instantly, you know, or, you know, I mean, obviously in a lot of families, you know, different political perspectives, but it can be any, I mean, let's face it, in a relationship, it can be anything and how we, what, it's like pathological, in the word pathological, it's pathological how we defend ourselves, our positions and make the other person the enemy. So, I mean, it, it, it's well, like, we, it's, we did, we did find that one, um, I can't remember what format it was, but he, you got a lot of pushback for saying something along the lines of um, you, the right person for you is going to hurt you or something like that. Yes. But that we that, hire that was, partners to rewound us. Yes. And yeah. Say, like that's, that's a motto. Yeah. And the, yeah, it is. And to me, sometimes like I think, you know, as a feminist media critic, which is what I did before I was an editor here. We're always on the lookout for something that will empower an abuser. Do you ever worry that your words, like someone's going to say, well, do you know, Dr. Joe Court, he's saying the one that hurts you is the right one for you. Not that it would be that conscious, but is there a way in which sometimes I can creep in and go bad? Yes. Yeah. I remember that video. Now I see the, I remember people because they moved it to like domestic violence. They moved my, what I was talking about wasn't even on my mind to say that. And I mean, it's a 60 second video, right? So I can't like do all these bullet points. But yeah, I mean, I know that people will do that, but people would do that regardless. That's how how I feel about that. People are gonna take little tidbits and little sound bites and and then make it their reality and use it against other people. So I don't worry about it because it's gonna happen regardless of whether what I'm saying or not. Because if you watch all my videos, I, I and I think I did a follow up video to that or I tried to and say, I'm not talking about 
like somebody else's agenda gets um, overridden on mine. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, another controversial one we were talking about, Andrea, and, and I think you've written about it for us here at Your Tango, is not all husbands that hook up with guys, husbands of wives that hook up with guys are gay or bisexual. Yes. That's what made me popular on TikTok. That was my very first video. Oh, mm. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a dancing one. Can you one. explain that? Like, okay. So, yeah. There, so, I have a whole book about straight men who have sex with men. They're not gay. They're not bisexual. And I always say that when a man has one non-heterosexual thought, he's stigmatized. When a woman has one non-heterosexual thought, she's fetishized. And both are problematic. And so, people don't understand that you can have a sexual orientation to whom you're attracted, which, which gender or any gender or no gender. And you can have an erotic orientation, the things that turn you on, the things that get you off. And so you may be cisgender, but imagining yourself erotically as transgender. You may be a feminist and anti-forced uh, sex, but you may imagine yourself having forced sex. It's an erotic orientation. It's, it's in your, the erotic realm, not the um, other realm. I see that. Yeah, so like we do, we do. We actually had another article on your tango. <laughs> you could tell I've been there for eight years. Like it's like, oh, we had an article on your tango like this. We talk about this at your tango, but how you can be a feminist and like to be dominated sexually, and that's not an anti-feminist choice. But I think there is a whole group of feminists that would say it really is. Yeah, I know. And there's a lot of gay men that are gay activists, but they like to be called in the bedroom, right? And that's just a, it's a it's an erotic thing. It has nothing to do with their politics. In in our erotic realm, we think about and do things that are taboo that we would never do in real life. And that's okay. I love there was a video that you had about how about food. It's like being forced to eat food. And and if you had your mouth washed out with soap when you were young, or forced to eat something like with hot sauce as a punishment, and you're saying and now that becomes erotic as as a grown up. And you said that's okay. Um, you know, don't shame yourself for it. And I just, I love that sweet sentiment, right? Because so many of us carry so much shame and it just feels like that's how we can, you know, we we can't wait for somebody else to take that shame away. Only we can take the shame away, right? And understand. Yeah, so people just, I, that's, I feel like I'm a shame reducer, mostly as a therapist. And helping people understand there's something wrong with you. What you fantasize about, if it's consensual and you have a willing partner, it's okay. Yeah. Let me ask you this. When you think about your life and your work, what do you care about most? Truth. I care about the truth and people finding their truth and the truth in their situation. I loved when I figured out the truth in my family. I love when I figure out the truth um, in my, like my husband and I, we've been together almost 31 years. He has Asperger's. I didn't know he had Asperger's. He didn't know he had Asperger's. This is before Asperger's was even understood in adult men. Once we understood the truth between us, that this was something, I'm neurotypical, he's neurodivergent, it changed everything. I love the truth. What about in your own family? Was Is that back to the narcissism? Or what What was the big truth that you, you discovered uh, from being uh, little? Yeah, the narcissism. Uh, so the invisible man in the room for me was narcissism. Once I understood that, then I knew how to navigate the system. I didn't know how to do it before. It was too upsetting. How much courage did it take? to to admit that and then to do something about it oh a lot a lot of therapy a lot a lot of years of therapy and then um just the loss you know and then the cut i had to do a cutoff for a while to figure it out but the grief and loss is horrible that I, that's what i was gonna say i i literally was telling my sister earlier today i remember i i lived in new york for many years sitting in central park it's gonna make me like a little emotional right now like 10 years ago across the street from my apartment literally sobbing on a street bench and I'm not kidding three or four people you know came up and were like are you okay and I was like I'm okay you know sobbing and I don't I don't recall the catalyst I just remember this profound sense this just inconsolable sense of grief um especially with my mom and it was just like and it's you know and in a in a big way it's like I'm loving toward her but you nailed it. I was parented, but not mothered. And, you know, and just that feeling now of saying, you know, my mom has dementia. I go down and see them. I, you know, I look after her, but it, it's a, it's just, oh God. So I'm sorry for you. Was, and I'm sorry for yeah. me. 
there's a great line in the show Pose. I don't know if you ever saw that, where this woman says to her mother, just because you were a terrible mother doesn't mean I can't be the daughter I want to be. And when I heard that, isn't that powerful? That's well, so, say it again. Not, say it again. Just because you were a terrible mother doesn't mean that I can't be the daughter I've always wanted to be. That is awesome. Well, and that's just, I mean, it's back to, or the wife I want to be, right? Or the parent I want to be. I mean, like to me, that is like the big amen. I love you, Joe Court, because when I think about the power that we can, not power in a gross way, but power in a beautiful way to say, I can, I can shift, you know, and show up differently in each of these important relationships. And I've really struggled with that in my own life. So that is that is awesome. And you said that was in a show a show called Pose. Sorry, I didn't catch the show. Yeah, it's about um oh my god, I forget. It's about trans people that were uh, in the nineties who created Vogue, um, the dance. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. I have to say, I think it's so interesting how those things creep up. Like you're saying, it was like ten years ago. You're sitting on a park bench, you're crying. My um, stepdad, who raised us as his own who was like, I had, I'm had i the rare person that had like an amazing dad with my stepdad. And after he died, I was sad, and but we knew he was going to pass. He died of COPD. And then like my husband and I got in a fight, just a normal argument. And I started crying. It was that like hysterical crying. And I said, I just don't think there's anyone left in the world who thinks I'm amazing. And it sounds so selfish and weird no it but doesn't like not it selfish or when weird you that's what parents, yeah yeah that's what a great parent yeah and he, yes and it's weird like oh i had this great parent and there's even grief with that because it's like i i could i don't want to say i could do no wrong but he was delighted by me as a child as you would want from a parent and so you know you're having a fight four years later or three years later and it's like all of a sudden you're like but that one person, you know, it does the and and you can't replace him. And just how grief like sneaks up and you oh, have grief to is sneaky. then yeah, you then have to heal it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and feel it. Yeah, and go through it. Absolutely. Well, the other question I have for you, I love to talk about uninvited Buddhas, the people in our life that we often resist or reject that end up having an important truth for us. I can I can project or speculate it, that an uninvited Buddha would be your your mom or dad, but who, you know, can you just talk about somebody in your life that ended up having something important to teach you, despite your initial resistance? Yeah, I um I had somebody who was um helping me with my business, and um that it didn't it turned out that it, that wasn't really the case, and I felt and I I believed at the time I think I believed this all the way up until my adult till my recent years that I can't do what I do without the help of whomever put their name in. But this person um, put me in a really um, compromising and challenging position. And I had to step in and save my business, save what was happening in this certain situation. And I did. And I, I realized that when I they were removed and I removed them, I could do, I did it all along. It wasn't that person. It wasn't all these other people in my life. It was Joe Court. I had they no need idea. It. Yeah, that's amazing. No. Well, and that's what I love. I, I just, when I think about so often in my own life and I observe in others where that, that resistance and we're so sure it's that other person is just our enemy. And I, I love that example where without them, you, Joe, Joe Court, would still be sitting here going, oh crap, I got to rely on these other people, right? I mean, that, yeah, I love that. It's like the, 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 the Wizard of Oz, you know, it was oh, always yes. inside of you all along. Yeah. It chokes me up when I think about it. <laughs> For you, it was your business savvy. Who knew that was your magic? Well, Joe, what other things before we wrap up? Is there anything burning that we haven't asked you about that you just feel like is important for you to, um, you know, really drive home? Um, you, yeah, you touch on all, almost everything I do. The only thing I want to add is that my biggest accomplishment in this field of psychology is that I created the term side for gay men. Do you know about this? Oh, I, yeah, I have, but do talk about it because that's a, that yeah. is a good one. So so there are, uh, when gay men have sex, they're uh, often, they're having anal sex. There's a top, the one who gives anal sex, the one who receives, the one who, re who uh, is the bottom. And then some can be versatile, but uh, I've never topped, I've never bottomed, I've never had anyone inside me, I've never been inside anyone else. It doesn't do anything for me. I don't have any eroticism around any of it. 
And so I was ashamed for years. People made fun of me. I had uh, gay friends make fun of me. Maybe you haven't met the right guy. Maybe you haven't had it done right. The same things we would say to a lesbian who um, who's being questioned about not wanting to do with men. And I'm like, no, I just don't like it. So in 2013 on Huffington Post, I wrote an article about um, being aside. I came out about it. And all these gay men and all these bi men and who, were, who understood came um, as supportive of, and felt like, you know, in a sense of belonging. And then in 2020 or 2021, Grindr the, and Scruff, the two biggest gay apps out there, dating apps, um, uh, use it now as a um, preference. So, oh, wait, Daniel, let me, let me understand. So, OK, not to get too kind of mechanical or technical here, but I, I get the non-penetration. So are we talking like side is oral sex or or some other kind of uh way of getting pleasured it's side is outer course everything but oh. intercourse ah okay got it got it okay yeah so no you can so it's everything what, what you would consider foreplay is really uh-huh. that is sex and as a sex therapist we always try to teach that to couples anyways well and that goes to your point joanna that goes to your point you know in terms of like the the kind of the um, monogamous. What did you call it? Monogamous. Monogamous. Monogamish. Yeah. Well, no, and the normative. Monogamous. Yeah. Monogamous. Yeah, just, I mean, just you know, it's like how things kind of get defined and and labels put on them. That normative, I think, is the operative word. And so I love that for you, Joe. That you're just like, hey, yo, there is a spectrum, and that it, you know, that gives permission to other people to say, ooh, yeah, I'm, I'm in this. You know, I'm kind of. I, I'm I'm interested in the different flavors, not you know, not just what is considered kind of standard. And sometimes we don't even know that we can feel something until we know the term. I remember feeling that way about being bi. It was like I like uh, what? How does this? I don't. And then you hear the word, you're like, oh, okay, that's a thing. Or think of all the asexual people. Asexual to most people is pretty new. Imagine the relief you'd feel finding out you're not the yeah, only one that's it's just so validating. Not into it. That's right. Yes. Okay. Joe Court, come back on our show, please. You are awesome. It's such a pleasure. You are amazing. I feel so much better after <laughs> after getting you know my therapy and podcast session all in one. Thank you. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay, good. Thank you. That was so good. Oh my so God. good. He's such a delight. He just I just oh. love his his energy. And wisdom, and I love his uh, uh, Michigan accent. <laughs> and somebody oh, from yeah, the Upper I know. Midwest, <laughs> right? I know. I felt so at home. <laughs> so, what, um, Joanna? What was your number one takeaway? Was there a favorite thing that he uh, talked about, or or what you do you know, want to act on? I want that's the thing. I'll tell you this. I'm going to act on. I'm going to share what was most challenging for me because I think it's also what was what I'm going to be thinking about. The idea of, I think when I asked the question about the guy who had chronicled all the times he was rejected, it was really in like a, um, I find that annoying about straight men stereotype mode. And I wasn't ready for him to say there's still a yes in the room. And I'm glad he did because it's true. And it's not always the man who's saying no. It's sometimes it's, it's, I'm saying yes. Sometimes it's a woman who needs a yes. And I want everybody to get what they need, especially given the fact that I think that prescriptive monogamy is a disaster, whatever. That was challenging for me to hear, but I know he was right. Mm, I love it. Oh, la la. That is boom. (laughs) Right now, because it's like, I mean, listen, one of the things that I'm really homing in on is the sense of righteousness that each of us have. We are so convinced of our own that that we've got the uh, lock on the truth. And so when I hear you say you were looking for a different, you were looking to be validated and he didn't validate you and you had the wisdom to go, oh, crap. That I mean, that is like, that's why we're doing the show, baby. So I love that. Thank you. Joe, uh, Brian, what about you? All right. I've got one that it was a little slip up and I want to circle back to this. Joanna, do you have a hot janitor? No. Does your kid have a... <laughs> Yeah, there's a total. Yeah, tell us I about was, the hot janitor that you're you're scoping out. You 100. percent We're like, oh my god, like, no, there was uh, this janitor at my kid's okay. school. Okay, hold my you know, mom. A hypothetical. I know. Oh, hold my mom, Andrew. Oh my god. Okay, I will say this. No, but, but what, maybe. I think, 
<laughs> the moment I said it, I was like, who's the hot janitor? And I was the one that said it. So no, we don't have a hot no, janitor. You told on yourself 100%. You want to know, know what it really was? was? I'll tell you <laughs> why I it? said it, Brian. I said it because I was going to say your high school boyfriend. And then I was like, I do not want my high school boyfriend to think that I'm still thinking about it. Hey, him. ding, ding, Jeff. ding. Uh, Joanna's yeah. high school boyfriend. She's, she's yes. thinking of you. Sorry, Jeff. I'm not thinking of you, which is yeah, why I had to do bit. the janitor. Uh, is, <laughs> is Jeff a janitor now? Is he Jeff the janitor? Is that what happened? No. Oh, my God. Oh, no. Okay. So, yeah, I was like, pick something it's not. And then I was like, oh, man, now everyone's going to look for the janitor. <laughs> Brian. <laughs> the janitor. That is so funny. Brian, that was I well done. That, that, that just like it, it flagged as like, oh, she said too much. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that it's That's appropriate because it's like, what did I say at the beginning about how unconscious confessions we're talking exactly. about unconscious confessions? It's meta. Oh my gosh, it's so funny, you guys. <laughs> that is so funny. I, I Andrea, I, I'm going to bring us down and just say the whole business of being parented but not mothered or fathered that hit home in a way that is, I mean, actually, it's in a good way. It's validating. And, you know, my my parents are awesome. I love them. They did so much right. And and yet, you know, there's there's a lot that I'm working on. And I mean, I, I would be so remiss if I didn't say, yes, I definitely mother my kids. I probably over mother my kids. But it is so humbling to be a parent um, when you are trying your best and you know you're screwing it up. And and that's what I feel like in with my boys or greatest kids in the world, you know, Nick and Alex. And it's always really humbling to go, oh, I need to, you know, like we've talked about before, I need to redo. How can I mother better? Right. So it just, it does feel like it, it is a, a framework that's helpful to me. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Especially like the trick is seeing the nuance, all the ways they were good and all the ways in which they were imperfect. And for some people, the ways in which they were abusive and still good in some ways, it's so easy to cast them into a binary. Yeah, the bi- yeah, totally. That perfectly said. And when I think about my life and my superpowers, some of them for me, I'm I'm super caring. I'm really compassionate. I try super hard in the relationships in my life, and I think those are all largely products of um, of how I was raised. And you know, and so I, I feel really lucky to not have a lot of. Um, blame and and resentment but just to look back and say oh those those things that were hard um i've been able to metabolize them into things that are beneficial you know and yeah and like that's and, how life's and, work for so many of us you know yeah and that's why a lot of times when we talk about like what would you go back and change or i wouldn't change anything at all it's such a that magical thinking can be so problematic because we do wish we could get rid of our pain but so much of our pain has given us the good things. We talk a lot about um, you and I both are uh, overachievers, uh, maybe even achievement addicts. And it's like, I need more, 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 more. Well, you know what? The good things we put out in the world, even when that process isn't great, when we're putting those good things out, they're still good, right? We don't have to do it forever, but it's like, you know what? Thank goodness I have a little bit of that. Thank goodness I have a little bit to prove because I feel good about what we're putting out in the world yeah i i'm with you it's such a journey it is all (laughs) right guys well thank you everybody for tuning in this has been another episode of open relationships transforming together we would love if you would subscribe to our show download the episodes give us feedback or advice you may email us at open relationships at your tango.com you can find us on iheart spotify youtube uh Amazon, Apple, wherever you find your uh, your podcasts, we are there. We are so passionate about doing this show so that we can transform together. So thanks for listening and we'll see you soon. Yay!